The title of this morning's message is The Difference That God and We Can Make. I came in here yesterday afternoon and I thought, well, I should time this because I haven't really kind of judged how long this will be and it was too long, like way too long. So I cut out all the fascinating parts, <laughs> all the interesting parts so that we could just talk about the important parts related to the, the theme here. Um, have you ever had the privilege of seeing little kids playing sports live? Anyone? We got lots of parents and grandparents and, and people who've cared for kids and babysitters. And so you've seen little kids, I'm talking five, six, seven year olds play sports. I like to see a lot of comedy in life and there is high comedic value in seeing kids play sports. I think my favorite is hockey. Little kids, five, six, seven years old. Well, first of all, they usually can't skate, but then when they do get going, they can't stop. <laughs> the only way they'll stop is if they hit an object, right? Like the wall or a goalpost, and that's humorous, or, or a moving object like another person, and that's really a great collision. And if it's not your child, it's just funny. <laughs> you say, that's terrible. They're wearing equipment, they're safe, they're fine. <laughs> Uh, but I think the most painful sport to watch little five, six, seven-year-olds play is baseball. Baseball is already a very slow sport, but then you add the attention span of a gnat that a child has, and when they're, when they're not out, when they're not up to bat, when they're outfield, like have you seen five, six, seven-year-olds? They are not in the game at all. It's like, my uniform. <laughs> My, my glove. And heaven forbid if a butterfly floats by, they are completely gone, right? Uh, and then there's the kids who are up to bat. Do you know that in t-ball, there is a no strikeout rule? A kid can swing a hundred times. And the whole team gets to go up before the next team goes up. Literally, the longest baseball games in the history of the world are kids t-ball games. And so there's a mercy rule of two innings only, and then the game's done. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, I heard, why am I telling you this? Because I heard the true story from a dad of his seven-year-old daughter playing softball. So the ball was actually pitched, and he was not the manager, he was the assistant manager, but he said every time my child went up to bat, I could not hardly watch. I had to go and sit back and say nothing because I get so frustrated. So he told this story again. I don't know if he embellished it, but he says it's true. So his daughter always, for some reason, closed her eyes just as the ball would be coming over the plate, and then she would swing. So the first pitch, he said, really, the pitch was more like a bowl. It was along the ground bouncing, and just as it hit the catcher's mitt, the daughter closed her eyes and swung, strike one. The second pitch was a good foot higher than her head, but as she heard it go over her head, she closed her eyes and swung, strike two. And he thought, well, here's another strikeout. But then the third pitch, he said it left the pitcher's hand at just about the right level. And he said, I thought, if all the stars in the universe align, maybe, She'll close her eyes, swing, and connect with the ball, and he was hopeful. But then he said, as I watched the ball, it was actually arcing toward her head. Oh. And he thought, oh no. And, and sure enough, she closed her eyes, and she took a swing, and it hit her square right in the head. But she was fine, she had a helmet on, it was all good. But he said the whole place went silent. And even the umpire. <laughs> He didn't know what to do. He'd never seen this before. Usually a hit bats person goes to base, but she swung. <laughs> so finally he says, strike three, <laughs> you're out. <laughs> and she was out. But then the little girl, his daughter, dragged her bat to the, <laughs> to the dugout, laid it down, and she went and she sat beside her dad. And she said, Daddy, did I do okay? <laughs> and this dad, when he told the story, he said, I realized in that moment 
that my voice in my little girl's life really mattered, that my words mattered. And so we're going to have, very briefly, a community conversation around that. If you were that parent, that coach, what would you say to your child and why? And how about this? What if it was someone else's child who asked you, <laughs> did I do okay? Okay, so get in groups of three or four, and just for a few minutes, talk about that together. What would you say to that child? Go ahead. What that dad would say to that seven-year-old daughter of his would have a huge impact on her life. It would shape her in a lot of ways. How she viewed failure and how she would view failure in the future in her life because she was sure to fail as we all do. It would shape how she would view her dad in her life. How he treated her when she failed and maybe even when she did something wrong. It would influence her view of herself. And it would influence her view of God. Whether we like it or not, whether we believe in it or not, little kids especially view parents as godlike in their lives. We become the filter for how they see God. Would she be judged by her performance? In that moment, that dad's voice mattered. She didn't need to hear what she did wrong or how to fix it. In that moment, she needed to hear that she had a dad that loved her even when she wasn't good at something. A dad that was with her in those moments. By the way, I, I won't tell you the full story, but that dad said all the right things to his girl. And my point is this, your voice matters. To every single person you know and every single person you meet every day and believe it or not you can make a difference in their lives when I read the first 11 verses of Acts 18 this theme just jumped off the page to me we're gonna see at least four identifiable relationships between Paul and others where God against all odds and people made a difference in other people's lives. And here's the four. Paul with a group of people. And then secondly, Paul with someone and someone. And then three, a different someone and someone with Paul. And then four, someone really big with Paul. Is that mysterious enough for you? <laughs> Do you have any idea where this is going? Okay, let's look at the first one. Paul with a group of people. It's in verse 1. After this, after the events of Acts 17, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. So Paul is now with the people of Corinth. How will he treat them? How will he treat them, especially if he discovers what they're really like? And this is where I had to cut out a lot of really fascinating information about Corinth as a city to get at what was important about Corinth as a people. Okay, so Corinth was the capital city of the region of Achaia, which is modern day Greece. It was on a major, unusual shipping lane, and it pains me to not tell you about that. It had a population of about 200,000 people, and that doesn't seem like a big number now. That was a huge number in the ancient Near East. In fact, it was 20 times the population of Athens, where he had just been. But its biggest claim to fame, Corinth was known as the sin city of the ancient world. Corinth was Las Vegas times Los Angeles times Wasaga Beach. <laughs> I grew up in Wasaga Beach. It's personal for me. I used to have friends from Toronto come up and say, oh, you live in Sin City. I would say, what? From Toronto? You're saying I live in Sin City? Toronto is Sin City. We're, we're kind of bad, but just on the weekends when you all arrive. <laughs> Sin City. Corinth was especially known for, now how do I say this delicately? It was known for its sexual freedom and expressiveness everywhere. 
At that time, in the ancient, ancient Near East, all over the world, there was an extra biblical phrase that went like this, to Corinthian eyes was to live as a sexually promiscuous person. Like the name Corinthian eyes was associated with that. There were a thousand prostituted women who were a part of how the people of Corinth worshipped their deities in the city temple. It was embedded into their worship. It was a broken place full of broken people on a desperate search for God in all the wrong places. Now, this is kind of hard to imagine what I'm about to share, but after Paul plants a church here in Corinth, listen to what he says to the followers of Jesus in that church. In 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body, for it is said the two will become one flesh? What kind of church needs to hear this? The church at Corinth needed to hear this. He goes on to say, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've, whom you've received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. See, they'd grown up thinking very differently. Very di Now, we need to hear this message today. We live in a Corinthian world, but not even to the extent of what it was at that time. Now, with all of that as a cultural context, how would Paul think about interact with and speak to the people of Corinth? Well, Paul saw them the way Jesus saw them. They were sheep without a shepherd. And so look what he does in verse 4. Every Saturday, every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Gentiles. Paul's voice and what he said to people like this, mattered. It mattered. And maybe it would make a difference. Now, you can't reach everyone. And so the Jewish crowd in Corinth, they responded poorly. Look at verse 6. But when they, the Jewish people, opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And you thought that modern-day theologian Taylor Swift thought of the concept, shake it off. <laughs> oh, oh, no, the Apostle Paul did. He shook it off. Now, he says something... Did Taylor Swift read the Apostle? No, anyway, he says something actually kind of heavy to them, doesn't he? Your blood be on your own heads. What he's saying is, it's your responsibility. And it's still true today. We individually are responsible for our response to God. This morning, you and I are responsible for what God will say to you today. You're responsible for your response. And so Paul says he's going to shift his focus to the Gentiles going forward. This is a big transition moment right here. So in verse 7, then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of tedious justice, a worshiper of of God. Now, tedious justice is a very Gentile name. There's not enough information here to tell us if he was a believer in Jesus, the Messiah, just that he worshiped God. We just know that this Gentile guy happens to live next door to a Jew Jewish synagogue. But as Paul stays there and shares the gospel in the neighborhood, look what happens in the next verse, verse 8. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. Paul's words and his voice made a difference in a family's life. God can change a family through the gospel coming to one person. We just heard that today through Jana. The gospel came to Jana's family and now all but her one brother have come to faith. 
My great grandfather was sitting in a, in a service in England when Hudson Taylor, the great missionary from China, came and he said, I want to take a hundred young people back with me to China. Who will go? And my great grandfather was compelled to stand to his feet and he went and he lived for 56 years and died in China. And the gospel came through him to our family. And on my mom's side, my uncle died Christmas morning, three days shy of his first birthday. And that broke my grandma's heart. But through that, she started seeking God. And she found him. And one by one, she led family members to the Lord. And the gospel came to and changed our family. And I know there's many of you here that has happened. And there's many of you here that your prayer is that that will happen. That the gospel will come and transform your family. So wonderful that it did with Christmas. Now, this is one specific family in Corinth that Paul, you know, made a difference in their life. But look at the effect of Paul being with the Corinthians in general. In 8b, many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. Paul chose to love them as sinfully broken as they were. He chose to see them the way God saw them, as broken people, no different than he was. Is that how you see the neighbors on your street? As broken people, no different than you are. Is that how you see the people in your condo or apartment complex? Is that how you love the service people you interact with? Maybe at the gas station or... or on the phone or in person from time to time. You know, we, we get so preoccupied with our immediate need that we don't even see people as people, let alone the broken people that they are in need of a shepherd just the way we do and did and still do. Well, look what happens here. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. This is significant. This is the second longest place that Paul ever stayed. He will stay in Ephesus for three years, but here in Sin City, Corinth, he would stay for 18 months. And what was the result of that? It changed many Corinthian people forever. Look at these words of Paul, and then we're going to move to the second point. These, these are words to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 6. Look what he says. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. And then he describes them. <laughs> Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were set apart, reserved for God. You were justified, declared righteous in God's sight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. God loved these people who were on a search for him and didn't even know it. And he called Paul to be with them as a blazing light of God's love. And listen, this is true. The darker the context, the brighter the light of a disciple of Jesus looks and sounds and behaves when Jesus is shining through them. So please don't ever think that in your family or in your workplace or in your neighborhood that your voice and your presence doesn't matter because the light of Christ, if you're a believer, the light of Christ is alive in you and that shines into the darkness. And those words that you share they have impact on lives. Paul with the Corinthians, and he makes a big difference. Secondly, Paul with someone and someone. Verse 2. There, in Corinth, he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. Aquila and Priscilla. What a cool couple. And not just because their names rhymed. Okay? 
we were, we were sitting in the uh, Jesus Revolution movie, and uh, the hippie street preacher's name is Lonnie, but at, at a certain moment, his wife Connie gets introduced, and one girl spoke right out loud, and she said, Lonnie and Connie, how cool. <laughs> Everyone looks at her. Maybe you've known a, a Bill and a Jill, or a Sam and a Pam. I met a Harley last week. I was thinking, man, if she marries a Davidson, that would be cool. <laughs> if some of you don't get that, we'll talk after. But Aquila and Priscilla were a dynamic couple. They're mentioned six times, six times in Scripture, and it's so obvious they were, they were all in for God. Can I share something? Do you know that singleness and marriage are both equally gifts from God. We can serve God either way. Paul in scripture says there's more freedom in serving God when you're single, and he's right. There are things you can do when you're single because you don't have the additional obligations. It's just true. Singleness is first class. Please hear that and know that. And being married is also first class. If you're married or planning to be, serve God together. Whenever Karen and I talk with couples, whether in premarital or, or postmarital, we try to encourage discovering ways to serve God together. Pray about it and experiment with even one way to serve God together. God will strengthen your marriage relationship through it. For Karen and I, serving God and others has been the best part of our marriage, period. It's been the best part of our marriage. By the grace of God and glory to God. So notice what happened to Aquila and Priscilla here. They got kicked out of Rome. Why? They got canceled because of ethnic discrimination. Emperor Claudius, also known as Caesar Augustus, ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Now, this is A.D. 51. Dark, darker days are coming. Just 19 years later, in A.D. 70, the Roman general Titus, who was the son of Caesar Vespasian, would destroy Jerusalem and put about 6 million Jewish people to death. Rome despised Jewish people. Would you notice, though, in the very last sentence here, what Paul does, Paul went to see them. I think that is so beautiful. Paul went to see. Paul's being Pastor Paul here. He went to encourage them. They needed that. They had been displaced from home and everything familiar, and Paul went to see them. Do you know what you can do to make a difference in a person's life? Go and see them. <laughs> Sometimes it's that simple. Go and visit them. It's called the ministry of presence. And it's one of the most powerful ways to bless a person. When Karen and I went through literally the deepest, darkest season of our lives together a few years ago, when Karen had a cancerous brain tumor removed, some of you will never know this side of eternity what it meant to us, and especially to Karen, to receive emails and phone calls and visits from people. It meant that she was known. Karen loves being with people and loves people being with her, and it meant that she was known and cared for and loved. Now, I know that not everyone speaks the same love language, but find out what a person's love language is and your voice and your presence in some way will matter. It will matter a lot and it will make a difference. And Paul got a job out of it. He got a job out of it, look at this. And because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. But I think they got something more out of it, don't you? Can you imagine hanging out and living with and working with the Apostle Paul? How great were the conversations that they had together. Now, tent maker, if you've been around the church any length of time, you've heard the expression, oh, she's a tent maker. He's a tent maker. Have you heard that expression? 
right? And in the church, we, we kind of know what it means. It, it refers to having a job that pays the bills while a person is involved in ministry. So I was a tent maker for 20 years. But it's a, it's a bit of an insider term. Like, what does it mean? People in the KW community are like, people still make tents? I thought you just bought them a Canadian tire. So I generally use the term bivocational, right? It means the same thing. Now, you, you might say, but wait, this is Paul, the great apostle. What is he doing working? I mean, other than the Lord's work. Well, guess what? All work is God's work. All work is God's work. You're a truck driver by the will of God. You're a custodian by the will of God. You're a coder by the will of God. You're a housemaker, child raiser by the will of God. You say, yeah, but Paul should have been spending all of his time preaching and teaching. He was a gifted and called person. When you're gifted and called, that's what you should be doing. Is it? Are you prepared to say that Paul was out of the will of God? I'm not either. He was not out of the will of God in being bivocational here. This was God's will for his life. Now, by God's spirit, Paul taught the Thessalonians that if you are able to work, you should. Otherwise, he says, you shouldn't eat. That's harsh, right? That's harsh. But clarity is kindness. Saying the right, necessary, and helpful thing to people may be tough love, but it's still love. If you're able to work, you should work. Well, because of the way Paul lived with and worked with Priscilla and Aquila, their lives were enriched because of it, and Paul's presence and words mattered, and we're going to see them even later in this chapter and, and the things God built into their lives because of it. So, we've looked at two relationships where Paul's voice mattered and made a difference. Paul with the Corinthians, Paul with Aquila and Priscilla, exiled from Rome. Two more, only these two are a reverse situation. Okay, it's someone and someone with Paul and someone really big with Paul in Corinth. So let's take a look. Verse 5. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Did Silas and Timothy coming to be with Paul make a difference? Did it ever? When they arrived, presumably some financial gifts from the Macedonian church arrived with them. And so this freed up Paul to leave, take a leave of absence from tent making and to devote himself fully to preaching. And who benefited from that? The people of Corinth. Listen, you, you might think, oh, I'm just helping one person in some small way. But there is always a ripple effect into other people's lives. I got to tell you a, a story, and I, I will probably get emotional because this moves me every time I think about it. When Karen and I were in student ministry, walking with, living with, just doing life with students, we were so conflicted about our kids. What do we do with our kids? Do we leave them at home with a babysitter? Do we take them with us? Like, what's that going to look like? And as we prayed about it, a, a mom named Cindy, a single mom with a teenage girl, came to us and said, hey, like your kids are so great and all the teenagers love them by the grace of God. And so, you know what? Why don't you bring your kids and I will just be totally responsible for them. And she spoiled them. She'd take, we'd go to youth group and they'd be gone for pizza or ice cream or whatever and she'd bring them back. And, and then we would go away for weekends on retreats and Cindy would come and she would look after our kids And our kids today, they were transformed by what they experienced of God moving in our youth group, of them being exposed to that. It changed them. And that's Cindy. And when I think of the people that our kids have affected and influenced and their lives have been changed, and that's Cindy. That's Cindy. That little act 
that seems so small, so insignificant, had a ripple effect and will for eternity. It's huge. It matters. It matters. One day, maybe in heaven, that's when we'll find out. That's when we'll learn that that small thing we did, the way we served in such a small way, that small way we gave, those prayers that we prayed, changed someone's life and eternity. And that's what Silas and Timothy coming is so quiet, and yet it was massive because it affected the Corinthians in a huge way. Well, one more. Someone really big with Paul in Corinth. I love this, verse 9. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in the city. Does this sound to you like Paul needed some encouragement? He did. And God himself gave it to him. It's actually hard to believe that Paul was experiencing fear. And possibly because of fear, a temptation. A temptation to keep his mouth closed. Have you ever been there? A temptation to keep your mouth closed? You say, sometimes it's a good thing. <laughs> and sometimes it is. But not when it's the good news being shared. It's not a good thing. And so check out what Paul wrote to the Corinthians here in his first letter to them. In 1 Corinthians 2, he says, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. Wow, something deep was going on in Paul when he arrived at Corinth. Aren't you glad that we're told this about Paul? I am so grateful for this. As humans, we can only take so much. Paul has been through, I was going to say the ringer, but like who knows what a ringer washer is. He's been through the grater. He's been through a cheese grater. Literally every town, every city that he's been to, with the exception of Athens, he has been opposed and he's experienced some form of physical, mental, or emotional abuse. And he's about at the breaking point when he arrives at Corinth. When does, God when does God tell people not to be afraid as he does here? When they are what? Answer it loud. Don't be afraid. Why? Because they're afraid. Paul was gripped with fear and anxiety. And Paul knows that prolonged fear and anxiety are not only missing the mark for a child of God, but they're, they're not good for your mental and emotional well-being. And he knows that God invites his children into freedom from fear and freedom from worry and freedom from anxiety. But how? Well, it's beautifully in the text through three promises from God. Look what it says. Do not be afraid, Paul. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Three reasons why. 10a, for I am with you. What's the first reason? I promise you my presence. The ministry of presence starts with God. What's the name of Jesus? Emmanuel. God is with us. What did Jesus say in the Great Commission? Go into all the world, proclaim the gospel, and... I am with you to the end of the age. And listen to this. This is a timeless truth. So this is for Paul. This is for you and I if we're believers in Jesus. This promise. It's in Isaiah 41.10. Do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That is a timeless, culturalist promise. I am promise you my presence. But then in 10b, no one is going to attack and harm you. What's the promise to Paul? I promise you my protection. My protection. No one's going to attack and harm you. Wow, wouldn't that be a sweet promise? Now, I got to say it. This is a very specific, time-bound statement to Paul in Corinth. This is not a blanket statement to Paul for the rest of his life, and it's certainly not a promise to us for the rest of our lives. In fact, you just look at Paul. Paul was beat up in, in Lystra. So did God protect him there? No. He would be beheaded in Rome in a few years. 
Does that sound like protection from harm <laughs> and attack? No. But this is a specific promise for the moment. I promise you my protection. And then thirdly, I have many people in the city. I promise you my plan. I have many people in this city. Well, who are they? You, you might think, well, okay, God's people are, are Paul and Aquila and Priscilla and Titus, and, or sorry, Timothy and Silas and Crispus, but who else? Those who are going to become God's children. That's who he's referring to. He's saying there's many people who are going to come into the family of God here in the city. I have a plan to change the lives of many, many people through your voice through your words Paul so do not be afraid keep on speaking do not be silent you know what someone here today needs to hear this maybe you have been gripped by fear for whatever reason and maybe because of that you have not shared Jesus with people and you've actually been silent and maybe that's with your family Maybe that's with someone at work. Maybe that's that, that friend you think is getting nothing out of it anyways, never listens to me. Hey, hear these words from God. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. I don't know that God promises that you won't be attacked and harmed. I don't know that. But I do know this. He says, I am with you. And my presence is enough for you. And I promise you, I have a plan. You don't know what it is, but I have a plan. As I close this morning, please understand that it's not what you say or how you say it. It's the message. It's the message that will change people because it's the message about him. Only God can do that. Can take what is dead and give it life. Only God can do that. God already did that. He took what was dead and made it alive in his son, Jesus. That's what he did. On the cross, he died, bearing the weight of a world's sin, bearing the weight of your sin and mine. But then he raised him to life. And what difference has Jesus made in your life? As we come to the table... This morning, those who are believers in Jesus, if you've, if you've received him as your Lord and as your Savior, you're invited to come and participate in communion this morning. But as you approach the table, would you be thinking about this question and try to answer it? What difference has Jesus made in my life? His words, his voice, his death, his resurrection. What difference has it made in my life he came to be with us and he calls us to go and be with others but I want you to hear this he came to be with us sacrificially and when he calls us to be with others he calls us to be with them sacrificially it's not always comfortable in fact it's usually not comfortable it's messy and it's hurtful but it's the way of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, our, our prayer the morning, uh, this morning as we began was that we would know you better, that we would grow in you, and that we would then go and represent Jesus well in this world. And I pray that as a result of today, that your voice in our lives will matter and make a difference. God, we come to this table right now and we thank you for the bread, not just because it's homemade. <laughs> we come because it represents the body of Jesus, your son, broken, sacrificed for me, for us. We come, we take this juice, and it's just a liquid, the fruit of the vine, but it represents the lifeblood of Jesus poured out for me, for us. For the sins of the whole world, yes, but for my sins. What difference has Jesus made in my life? We thank you for these elements now, and we take them 
with so, so much appreciation for who you are and for what you've done. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.